And in this special interview, I'm joined by uh, Linda Gale Baker, who is a professor of medicine and deputy director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center and uh, the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, and uh, is the immediate past president of the International AIDS Society, which basically had her man she started your mandate in basic 2016 to 2018. Okay. So it's a great pleasure to have you in our studios. Thank you, Tony. Very re real pleasure to be here. Right. Um, you, you're here as part of uh, the ICASA conference that is, that is taking uh, place in, in, in a few days. It's basically started already. And um, the conversation is, is around HIV and AIDS. And basically, I'd like to start you know, um, asking you, you know, the Eastern and Southern Africa region has at least 50% of the global HIV infection, which I would say is, is crazy. But um, there has been so many efforts, be it at a national level and regional level, to mitigate you know, new infections of HIV and be able to curb um, you know, the spread of HIV. What do you think um, the region and the international community that, and, and the United Nations and World Health Organizations should embark on to make sure that um, there are strategies to make sure that HIV um, treatment is, is inclusive to everybody and generally, you know, reduce the, um, the prevalence of HIV in this region? So I think you've hit the nail on the head. The important thing is really to get treatment to every single corner of the region. Right. In some ways, it's a, I mean, it's odd to say, but it's, it, there is a silver lining in having the biggest burden of infection in our part of the world is that it is a conversation that most people can have. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has heard of HIV um, and it really does, you know, perfuse the, the whole area. Uh, but now it's important, and, and that is the, 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 the nut, really the, you know, the crux of this thing is that we have to get to that last mile mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be the hard work is is getting to absolutely every individual making sure they're all tested that those who test positive get onto antiretrovirals as soon as possible same day if possible uh, and that those individuals are virally suppressed that means they have to take the treatment as prescribed mm -hmm for the rest of their lives. Mm. And we know that when people are virally suppressed, then we get the prevention benefit as well. And so this is really critical, uh, that treatment is got to absolutely everyone. UNAIDS has given us this 90-90-90 target, but actually we have to think about 100, 100, 100, right. um, if we really are going to bring the epidemic under control. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about that, you, you, you are a champion you know, of, of, of women in your country, and, and, and this has gone beyond borders, especially those that have, um, you know, with HIV infection. But it's still, it's prevalent that the number of women infected with HIV is higher than the men. And, uh, you know, it, it, it creates a gap that in most cases, you know, many people don't even know why that is. Would you please take us through the reasons why we have a higher number of women, you know, with HIV than men? Yeah, and the, the reasons are, like so many things, multifactorial. So there's no doubt that um, women are more vulnerable uh, biologically and socially and just in terms of um, the way society is structured. Mm -hmm. So. The most common way that HIV is transmitted in our region is through sexual intercourse. Um, and where women are not able to have a say on safer sex and, and take control of their own sexual lives, uh, we know that their vulnerability is increased. Um, having said that, we also know that we, because of the burden of disease, there is a very high uh, force of infection in our area. So, Really, everybody in our region is at risk of HIV acquisition, and that's kind of the mindset we have to have. So we have to come to this epidemic with a very strong harm reduction approach. Uh, what can we do to reduce the pool of infection? And that means you know, also thinking about primary prevention strategies. So it is very important that uh, we have prevention strategies that are directed and tailored for men, 
uh, for women and for younger people um, in, in a way that really takes into cognizance that each of those groups are unique mm -hmm. and have their own needs uh, and that we tailor our services accordingly. We now have prevention opportunities for everybody. For a long time we've been dependent on the male condom uh, and obviously that puts women at a great deal of, of disadvantage. Um, but now we are actually able to come to young women and, and offer them a menu of prevention mm. options. So the world has changed in the last 35 years and I think we, we really do have the tools now that we can sharpen uh, to move ourselves towards um, epidemic control. Mm -hmm. It requires, however, full-scale attention and engagement of everybody in the right, region. Right. Now, talking about that, maybe this is a question I should be asking you at the end, but do you think it's possible to break the cycle of transmission of HIV? Yes, I think for the first time we have this very nicely described. Um, and in some ways, you know, maybe people will say, well, it's intuitive. But on the other hand, we now have sound scientific evidence that young women um, in our region are at risk of acquiring mm. HIV from men who are not very much older than themselves but somewhat older than themselves. Um, that they then settle down into, uh, into more stable relationships it's at that time that they transmit virus to young mm. men. Um, and these young men in turn become slightly older men who infect younger women. And so it really is a vicious cycle that requires us to come in in a very strategic way right. in each one of those populations to say, where are these men? Mm -hmm. Have we got them in our services? Are they tested and are they virally suppressed? Because we know if they're virally suppressed, they won't transmit the virus, right. even if they're having sex with younger women. Where are the young women? What are we doing to empower them, uh, to give them prevention options, so that even if they have sex with older men, which we will discourage where we can, uh, but should they do this, they will still be protected. Right. And when they have relationships in a discordant way, where they may be infected, but a young man coming into the relationship is not yet, we can come to that discordant relationship if people undergo couples counselling and testing to actually say what can mm. we do within that. What are the alternatives exactly. for them to, to be safe in the process? And I'm so excited as a HIV researcher clinician that we do now have choices and alternatives. And maybe that's what I should basically delve into the the the, the, the vaccine research and, and, and your core lead, basically the HVTN, which is the HIV Vaccine Trials Network 702 you know, that is being run in South Africa. You know, tell us a little bit about that and how, you know, the, the research you're running is, is bringing about solutions and, you know, a widespread of options for, for people to explore into. So, Tony, I've already mentioned that, um, you know, we, we actually do have a good set of tools in our back pocket and, and there's no doubt that our governments, our policy makers should be collecting around how do we deploy those tools in an effective way. But right. there is no doubt mm -hmm. that a vaccine is going to be the ultimate way to control the epidemic in our region. We, that is applied to polio, it's applied to smallpox. Mm -hmm. we, we won't get complete elimination of an infection uh, such as HIV without a vaccine. efficient vaccine. Right. So that research is ongoing. And again, we're at an exciting time in our lives where there are a number of vaccine trials underway um, and we should be seeing the results of those within a couple of years, which will really give us a sense of how viable is uh, the... Well, let me say, I have no doubt we will ultimately find a vaccine. The question just is how soon. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the results of the trials that are currently in the field will give us a sense of how close mm -hmm. we are. We should hear results of those within the next one to two years. So right. again, an exciting time. Right. So if maybe you could delve into that a little bit more, um, how will these vaccines work? Like, what are, are they drugs? Are they injectables? You know, how, how do they look like? So the, the trials I'm talking about are old-fashioned vaccines. They right. are immunogens that cannot cause HIV, but they are designed to look like HIV, mm. so that when you inject them into an individual, that individual creates an immune response, which will protect the individual against HIV should they be exposed 
mm. to a, an infection. So right. pretty much the way people understand measles or mm -hmm. polio vaccines work, mm -hmm. those trials are on the road at the moment. The one has been um, designed on the basis of the Thai trial that your, your, your listeners may have heard about, came out in about 2009 and showed a 31% vaccine efficacy. So it reduced HIV acquisition by 30%. And we've taken that design and improved upon it. And we're hoping the results we're going to see are going to be better mm -hmm. than 31%. So that is the good old fashioned vaccine strategy that is underway. Your listeners may have heard about this thing called pre-exposure prophylaxis, right, which sometimes, prep. you know, can be confused. That's PrEP. That is actually an antiretroviral based prevention modality. Again, that people take ahead of time mm. in the risk that they may be exposed to HIV. So it prevents HIV acquisition um, by taking something ahead of time, hence right. the pre-exposure. Right, and I, and, I, and, I, and I believe it also goes with the post, you know, exposure, which, which might as well be used when someone has fears or definitely when, when they think they've acquired HIV. Now, um, as we come to the end of this interview, they said that 24, 24, 24 and a half million um, uh, people that need treatment globally when it comes to HIV infection, and it still seems that that number is huge. You know, the gap, the need is still a lot. Um, don't we think we're moving ahead of ourselves, um, trying to look into other alternatives of, of curing HIV without even trying to suppress the number of those that are already infected? You know, I think we've had four universal test and treat studies that have been conducted in our region. And what those have shown is that it is absolutely imperative to reach all the people who need HIV treatment. In fact, we know those are 38 million people in the world right, today. Right. We have to reach those people, we have to get them onto antiretrovirals, we have to suppress them. What the trial showed us is that although that is very important to do, it is not going to be sufficient to get ultimate control of the epidemic. Right. So like any communicable disease, we have to come at it from treatment of those who are already infected and prevention of those who are not infected. Right, right. It has to be a, a tango, if mm. you like. It has to be a combination of those two aspects. And so it's a tough order. I totally get it. I know mm. governments are struggling with saying, my first mandate is treatment. And that is absolutely right. But if we really want to get this epidemic under control, we're going to have to engage in primary prevention as well. Mm. And so that's the that's the, the discussion to be having at ICASA this week, is how do we get that balance right? We get the treatment going, but we bring the prevention in on the side to protect those who are not infected. And do that in an integrated way within our health systems to make sure that our health systems can cope with doing both mm -hmm. as effectively and as impressively as I believe we can in this region. Right. You know, I think we're ahead of the rest of the world in so many ways mm -hmm. when it comes to the HIV response. And it's really up to us now to take this home, if you like, you know, get the full run, um, finish the over, whichever your sporting uh, right. analogy that you want right. to use. But we've got to finish this, uh, this war, and, and I believe we can. Mm -hmm. Now, um, my last question, which is basically, um, you know, your, basic, your feeling and, and your sentiment when it comes to when you think, say, the, the region, okay, let me just say Africa in general. What time frame do you think, with the measures and incentives and strategies set in place, they'll be able to curb HIV infection, bring it down to zero? That, that is And a, how many generations oh, to come? That's a tough question. I'm a right. mother. I would love to think my, you know, my child is, is going to be protected. I really hope my grandchildren right. uh, will, will see a world without AIDS. Um, what, what I'd like to do is step back a little bit and say, mm. we were, as a region, appalled by mother-to-child transmission, that young children were right. being born with the virus. We put in place a global plan to eliminate mother-to-child transmission. When we all jumped on that plan and we were all engaged in the most extraordinary way, we saw the reduction. that reduction mm -hmm. that was mind-blowing, awe-inspiring. Now, we've let go of that a little bit. And the lesson that I have there is that we can do it, 
but we've got to see it through to the end. We've got to keep engaged, every single one of us, and absolutely make sure that the ball is in the back of the net before we call time and, and head back to the, the change room. You know, And I feel like in some ways we disengaged on the global plan to eliminate mother to child, and we haven't eliminated mother mm. to child yet. We, we've got quite close, but we didn't quite get there. We know there's work to be done in West Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, so that I think is the message we have to take away here. It is too soon to call it time. Right. Uh, and there is much we can do. The faster we work, the harder we work, the more we're engaged, the sooner we will see uh, this, this eradication that you speak of. Right. And I believe we can do it. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna take us all Collective efforts, joining hands and make sure that it Absolutely. happens. Absolutely. Regardless of however much time it might take us. In ag agreed, or how much money, unfortunately. Mm. Right, right. But I think, you know, we can do it. Right. Thank you so much for your time and, you know, sharing these brilliant ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing from you on Wednesday. Thank you so much for having, having me. You. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.